Uh, good morning and welcome to the third meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I would like to remind members and the public to turn off their mobile phones and any members accessing committee papers uh, using electronic devices should please ensure that they are switched to silent. We begin today's meeting with the first evidence session of an inquiry into Scotland's screen sector. The focus of the session today will be vision, leadership and strategy, and we will hear from two um, hugely experienced and knowledgeable panels of witnesses to discuss Creative Scotland's proposal for a new screen unit. Before introducing our first panel, I'd like to emphasise that today's session is an opportunity for members of the committee to hear the industry's reaction to the new screen unit proposals. And the committee will be considering more specific areas in our inquiry over the coming months, uh, and we've built in an additional time to examine any emerging issues uh, from today's session that are raised by witnesses today. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to remind members and witnesses that time is very short and we have a lot of ground to cover, so if questions and answers could be as succinct as possible. Uh, I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses, John McCormick, who was chair of the Screen Sector Leadership Group, uh, Ken Hay um, from the Scottish Screen Sector Leadership Group, uh, Dr Bell Doyle uh, of the Association of Film and Television Practitioners in Scotland, um, the director Kenny Glennon, Chris Young, managing director and producer of Young Film Foundation, and Professor Philip Schlesinger, Professor in Cultural Policy at the University of Glasgow. Uh, you're all very welcome. Um, <clears throat> now, some of you have sat on uh, the Screen Sector Leadership Group, and uh, I'm sure you're all very aware uh, of its uh, conclusions. Uh, what struck me um, was uh, it's the priority that it put on um, addressing the fragmentation uh, in, the in the industry. Uh, and I guess I wanted to begin by asking you uh, whether you felt that the screen unit proposal uh, addressed uh, some of the issues raised in the screen sector leadership group adequately, in particular that fragmentation uh, which has dogged support uh, for the industry over the years in Scotland. I don't know if you want to start, Mr McCormack. Uh, th <laughs> thank you, convener. Thanks. Um, I mean, first of all, I should say how um, uh, the support of this committee in supporting our recommendations is very encouraging and has supported people throughout the industry that the, the committee is spending time on, on this consultation. <coughs> and uh, during the last few months of uh, last year, the group was consulted uh, over two major occasions um, by Janet Archer and her colleagues on the developing proposal for the, school, for the screen unit. And so the the final proposal was informed by that. Not everything that's there was um, discussed or recommended within our group, but a number of the changes that we suggested um, have been implemented in, in the final shape. And as you know from our previous discussions, we support the creation of the unit. Um, and uh, the issues I would like to raise since time is short, really, in relation to um, the papers of the committee is, I think we've, we now have a, a structure and we now have to take very great care about the detail of it, the governance, the accountability, and the implementation of that structure. Um, uh, I think it's crucially important to refine the detail of the remits, the accountability, what happens, but the protocols around the screen, the screen committee and where the decisions are taken. And of course, your predecessor committee recommended the setting up of the screen sector leadership group because it talked about the dysfunctional relationship between Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise as the two major public bodies concerned within the screen sector. And the screen committee on paper looks at addressing that by bringing the public bodies around the table. But um, I think there has to be some clear purpose and definition about what the role of that screen committee is. Bringing people around the table doesn't mean agreement or decision making. And what the role of that committee is, um, is not clear. And I think that's the next stage that we would like to spend some uh, time assessing with um, colleagues in Creative Scotland uh, about the role of the committee. You bring people to the table doesn't mean to say that it's anything other than will it be a monitoring and a reporting group, keeping an eye, as this committee has done so intensively, keeping an eye on what's going on and whether people are falling back from their commitments. We need to make clear in the governance setup that's there, and it's not clear, I don't think, in the paper, about where decisions are taken and at what level of discretion the leadership team for the screen unit will have 
to make decisions, make deals, get things moving within the industry. And we have to make clear too in the small print that the things we said right at the beginning, that um, the areas of influence and power that Creative Scotland did not have, which were retained within Scottish Enterprise, if one goes back three years to that report of your predecessor committee, and where people, when we were doing our work, people described as a roadblock to progress and a roadblock to decision making. I have to make clear that in the protocols for that screen unit committee, and its relationship to the board of Creative Scotland, that that's all cleared out. There are no roadblocks, clear decision-making, clear accountability, and I don't think that's there yet, but I do think it's the next stage between now and March, April to get that right. And in the autumn of last year, we were discussing open discussions with uh, Janet Archer and our colleagues about that would be the next stage of our work and to contribute to that discussion and the shape of that. Um, do you think there's enough in industry input into the <coughs> governance structures? Um, I, I don't know what government that we, we haven't um, we haven't as the group the group did not contribute to the government. We, we said the next stage is we'd want to look at the governance structure. The, the unit would then have to be shaped. It would have to be published, and then we'd discuss the governance and the accountability. And we thought there was time to do that in the first three four months of this year. And so that's our next task. Frankly, we would have had these discussions maybe earlier in January, um, but it wasn't propitious uh, to do that then. But I'm looking forward to those discussions, and we'll have a screen sector leadership group before the end of March to discuss these issues, and I'm fully and the anticipating the involvement of uh, It's supposed Creative to be Scotland delivered by April. Is that achievable? Yes. I, I, well, I mean, it's the detail we need to be working out. They're working out detail. We'd like to test it. We'd like to make our contribution to that. And I think although the unit has to be up by the 1st of April, the first year, I think you've got to get it right and spend the time getting it right. Um, uh, and so the, the full implementation of it, we're aware of the changes in you know, a new chair of Creative Scotland and all of that, which has delayed things. So once we know uh, when the new chair is uh, uh, announced, and we are very much aware of the fact there is no one on the Creative Scotland board with any screen experience, and that has to happen to make sure the governance and the accountability works. And so there have to be new appointments, and that will be... Uh, a process that takes some months, as we know. So I don't think I think we've got to get it right in time. I don't think we'll get it all right by the first of April, and we'll do our best to contribute to the development of that governance structure and make our views clear. Um, but we need to have clear decision making, clear accountability, and we need to uh, have people who are leading the leadership of the of the screen unit able to take decisions, make deals, uh, and have the accountability for that. Um, and. The screen unit, as designed on paper at the moment, we haven't had any discussions about the detail of it, but it'd be very important to see the level of attendance at that meeting from the different public bodies, from the Funding Council, from Scottish Enterprise. Would it be people who can make decisions? Would it be people who can support the new ventures and recommend, recommend new exciting projects? Or will it be people coming to do a checklist and monitor what's been achieved? And part of the accountability, rather than part of the strategic focus for the new screen unit. Okay. At Bell Doyle and your organisation's letter to the Cabinet Secretary, you raised concerns about, about governance, in particular that it could be more civil servants round the table, I think, to paraphrase you rather crudely. Um, uh, is, is that, is, does that remain your concern? Um, yes, it is, because I do I think there are, well, there are certain practical considerations about how do you talk to an entire industry and a very flexible freelance industry. How do we get people on board with this? You know, I, I know people are very supportive of this screen unit as an idea. I think what we're concerned about is the idea of representation and accountability. And for all of us, delivery, because we want to see that things will change and that things will, there will be more work for people and people will be able to correct progress careers in Scotland, that would be the ideal for us. However, um, we haven't heard back from the Cabinet Secretary yet, so I don't know <laughs> what potentially is happening. But we wanted to raise our, our concerns at the very highest level. doesn't mean that we're not supportive of the, of the screen unit. It's about, as John says, the governance, accountability and the monitoring of it. Does anyone else want to come in on these points? Chris Young. Yeah. Of course, yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I couldn't figure out the button there. It, so I just want to. It's automatic. You don't right. need to right. worry about All buttons, right. so you're okay. okay there. Love it. Perfect. <laughs> um, 
I, I mean, I don't want to sort of jump ahead, but just picking up on that word fragmentation, and I think, I mean, uh, my, you introduced me to the Young Films Foundation. In fact, that's one side of what I do. I'm a producer. The, the, uh, the foundation has kind of grown out of a recognition that there is a gap uh, in opportunities for new, particularly writing, directing, and producing talent um, to stay in Scotland, to have a reason to stay in Scotland. And um, that's something that many people are, and institutions are addressing, but that's something we want to address up in Sky, where we're based. Um, and it came out of a, uh, a project of um, making a, a large number of television drama programmes for the Gaelic Channel, BBC Alipa, which we've been doing in Sky, and which necessitated us to train uh, a lot of new, uh, both uh, craft and talent. Um, the point I just wanted to jump into on fragmentation, I think speaking really more as a producer now in terms of um, one of many producers in Scotland, obviously the, the news of the screen unit and the proposals that are outlined are very exciting for anyone working in Scotland as a producer. Suddenly we have uh, a dedicated fund which opens wider in terms of um, content and what, what we can apply for. So uh, there's no question from my point of view that uh, it, it, um, the sooner that's up and running, the better. And I think all the proposals that the SSLG have come up with and indeed the screen unit have uh, seem to have followed a lot of them are to be welcomed. I mean, they, I, one, from my point of view, yeah, one can only think this is, this is the beginning of a whole new thing and it's very, very exciting. So. Um, uh, unequivocally excited by that. Um, but the fragmentation, I think, does remain a very, very serious issue because we work, speaking again as a, uh, from the, pro the producer's hat here, it, it's a global market we work in. We go out to fund <clears throat> our projects. The danger with uh, the situation we're in here is that if there are a group of significant players in Scotland who uh, are not as it were, joining forces as part of uh, or collaborating effectively with what's going to be the key, in public terms, screen unit in Scotland, key kind of source of funding, um, then, th then there's a problem because, uh, to put it in very concrete terms, um, it, 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 it all comes down to autonomy. And as a, as a producer, I'm, I'm looking uh, you know, we're, we're talking um, production in Scotland. What we what we want is to go to the screen unit and other sources of funding, and know that there is autonomy across all those Scottish entities. And for me, the elephant in the room remains the BBC, and particularly BBC Scotland. And my particular experience with uh, doing a Gaelic language drama with BBC Alipa, MG Alipa, has been that I have. Uh, worked uh, and uh, had a very positive experience working with uh, an organisation that is autonomous and makes decisions in Scotland. Um, that is not the case when one's dealing with BBC Scotland because they decisions are made in London and the key decisions for drama. There is no. There was talk of a drama commissioner that was uh, made by Tony Hall, but the fact is there is no autonomous drama commissioner in Scotland. And I think that is just one, one example, but that's where the fragmentation problem is going to arise. Because, one uh, of the things, if I could just butt in there, one of the things that the, the, the paper by um, Scottish um, uh, Creative Scotland says that their ambition is to have um, agreements, uh, partnerships with commissioners uh, uh, very uh, in, welcome. in the BBC yeah. and other channels. Um, but are you concerned about how that's going to be delivered? I think it's very experience? difficult to see how that will be delivered because I think the concerns of, I mean, I think going back to a sort of broader picture, how can we ensure that, you know, again, if I put it from, from the producer's point of view, the screen unit is there as a resource, but I'm going to go to the screen unit as a way of part funding a project. And how can we be sure that when I go to all those other uh, co-funders, the screen unit is going to be, well, let's put it negatively, is not going to be in some way 
just used by uh, entities who don't have a particular commitment to all the things here, which are to do with a, a kind of legacy and a long-term strategic investment in Scottish production. And I think that's the danger, because it's not just about money. How do we incentivise not just BBC Scotland, but Netflix or Amazon or anyone else who wants to... Because everybody's going to be very aware that Scotland is a place where they will be welcome both to fund and make work. But how do we ensure that S Screen Unit doesn't end up simply um, being, if, if you like, uh, being the, the tail of the of the dog, and and uh, or rather being the dog that's being wagged by the tail? That's Amazon. <laughs> so, very confusing Kenny, metaphor. Kenny. Sorry, got my metaphors mixed. But but the, 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 my concern is. And it comes back to fragmentation. I think John made the point well at the beginning. How? how so it is about. <coughs> obviously, you've got, we've got to get the Scottish enterprise and, and Creative Scotland thing going. But I think in a wider context, how do we ensure? And this probably comes back to leadership and and uh, strategy and vision. But who who is going to run the screen unit? Who is going to guarantee? And I don't think we can just put it down to personality. But we we will need to be really really careful that. Uh, the screen unit offers so many things to so many people and that it doesn't actually end up being, in some sense, uh, used for purposes of others, because that's that's the danger here. Um, and it all comes back to autonomy, and of course it reflects on the difficulty that we have in our own relationship as a small country within the UK and with Westminster and all of the rest of it. So, I mean, I am stating the obvious, <coughs> but, uh, but fragmentation was what I wanted to just... Uh, Kenny Glennon, you, you were nodding there, is that... I can say that you know, share. Uh, Chris articulated it very well. I think that uh, I, I think the proposal is very adventurous uh, and and really exciting. Uh, in terms of screen, uh, it's talking about it's talking about moving into television as much as representing the, the film sector, uh, and I think. I think within that, that committee, you need people who, who have experience of working in television uh, on the committee. I think the BBC is central uh, to, to anything, anything that moves forward. I think there's a great opportunity, but I, you know, I think we're we're back 20 years now. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, in Scotland, we have a you have a I think a commissioning editor who then speaks to someone who is uh, the commissioner for the North, uh, who then speaks to BBC London. I'm not sure that's the case for BBC Wales or for BBC Northern Ireland. So we don't have in television a. Uh, we don't have we we don't have a department that commissions work from up here. I'm a director. I work in television and I've made low budget feature films. Uh, so I I, I kind of see all the time. I see a kind of a decision making a, a decision making process which has a frame of reference which doesn't include. Uh, Scotland at all on any level it, it, it's 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 like a war zone out there right, okay. I, I, yeah, I, I, it really is and it's happening just now this year this is what we're involved in so I think what the committee what the what they're setting out the proposal I think is fantastic I think there's a lot of wishful thinking and positive thinking in there and I think we have to bore down really into that relationship with the, uh, with the broadcasters and uh, with the commissioners yeah. so, that we can, we, so that we have leverage within that and we don't become a bucket shop. Yeah. We don't become the, the, the tail wagon. We will be, the committee will be having a session on commissioning and yeah. with a view to feeding into Ofcom's yeah. uh, uh, consultation. On yeah. that, but I'm aware of time, so I'm going to pass on to Claire Baker now. Yeah. Um, thank you, convener. Um, to be honest, I'm quite concerned by what I've heard uh, this morning, notwithstanding the, um, the, the expression that these issues could be dealt with and the timescales we're facing, but looking at you know, the screen unit being operational from April, the new appointments being in place, 
the concerns I'm hearing around governance, around decision making, uh, are uh, are quite worrying, to be honest. When we look back at what the Economy Committee said three years ago, these are the key issues that all this work was meant to try and resolve. Um, and I'm concerned that I'm feeling that we haven't got to that stage yet. There is maybe an argument that we can get there, but given the time skills and the fact that Creative Scotland have already published proposals that don't go to that level of detail, even though it runs to many pages and very lots of technical jargon within it, it doesn't deal with these core issues that seem to be continuing. The question I'd planned to ask this morning was, does the proposal from Creative Scotland in terms of roles and responsibilities, will it deliver the transformative change we all want to see, which was the purpose of the report three years ago and the work you've done yourselves? Um, but I'm concerned that we're not at that stage yet. And if we look at the Creative Scotland document, it publishes 12 action plans. Um, around those action plans, are you confident they can be delivered? Um, do you think they're the right direction to be taken. It includes increasing capacity within um, studio space, uh, which has been an ongoing issue for politicians, maybe because it's the easiest one for us to grasp when it comes to understanding the screen sector, but we still don't, we would argue, we still don't have a studio space that is suitable for attracting the kind of business and giving opportunities to the television sector as well as the screen sector. So sorry, that's quite a, a long <laughs> question, but um, uh, it's just to say I am quite worried by the feedback we've heard this morning. Sure. Do you mind if I make a, a quick response to the speaker's uh, comments? I think it, it, it's fair to say it's a timing issue. I mean, there's no doubt that during our discussions around the group with the Creative Scotland team and Jan uh, with Janet Archer leading them, um, and in discussions I've had with them myself as chair of the group, I mean, they get it. Um, so I have no reason to doubt that their approach to governance would be, they knew what needed to be done, they supported our report and the recommendations, the fragmentation, the need for decision making, the need for people to be in the leadership team who could make deals, who could make decisions quickly to respond to the industry, need for quick decision making and proper investment. Um, they get all of that. Now they've come out with a model which was only published in December that we haven't interrogated yet. For various reasons, we haven't interrogated it. I, ha I have no reason to doubt that when we do have that discussion with them fairly quickly, that they'll, they'll respond in the same way that um, members of this committee would want them to. I have no reason to doubt that they've got a system of work. It's just not there in the paper yet. And because of the past relationships between the public bodies, which the committee drew attention to, we've just got to be reassured that the working is there and that the different members of the public bodies know <coughs> what their involvement is and they're not getting in the way. They're there to help support, develop the strategy and make sure that the different bits are joined up. We just need to have that reassurance. Um, and if it's not done by the 1st of April, then maybe it will take a little longer to, to develop. But I have no reason to doubt that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet and facing in the same direction, but we have to have the discussion about the governance arrangement to reassure ourselves, and especially the lack of um, screen knowledge experience background within the Creative Scotland um, board and how that would reflect into the screen unit. And as uh, Kenny said, the, the membership of the unit, we need to be, be reassured about that. But, Given the way that the, the team have responded to the, the group's recommendations in the past and taken on board what we said, I mean, I think it can happen. Mm -hmm. I have no reason to I mean, doubt it. How that. important do you think the upcoming appointments are? Um, do you think it is? Crucial. It, Crucial. Yeah. Crucial. And how yes. likely is it for Scotland to be able to recruit somebody or a group of people who will be able to work at the international level that we need? I mean, we went to visit Northern Ireland Screen. We've had uh, discussions with other... Um, you know, screen sectors, mm -hmm. that seems to be a crucial part of it, is that there's leadership, there's decision making, there's a, a limited, while there's uh, governance and accountability, there is still a clear decision making pattern and there's a hand for the people who can make crucial decisions. It is a commercial business we're dealing with then when it's screen television. It operates different than from other creative sectors. I to that, uh, which is that <clears throat> we're in a chicken and egg situation here. <clears throat> of course there are people with the talent and the uh, skill and the leadership, but we have to have the confidence to believe that there are such people as well. Because I think the danger we have, and I, I'm, and I don't want to, I really don't want to go back into uh, bad-mouthing BBC Scotland, which seems to be my sort of default, so forgive me, but, you know, there does seem to be a mindset in certain 
<clears throat> areas in Scotland that you know we have to bring people in. And I am I've been in Scotland in Sky for 20 years making programs, and there are many many people I'm working with who are extremely talented and able, but that is not recognised because there is a mindset that if, unless you're south of the border. You don't really know anything, so I'm not, sorry uh, to say yeah, that. But it's not suggesting we bring people <coughs> in. What we've also heard is people, you know, start off in Scotland, they then move down to London, they go to LA. They, it's trying to encourage that cohort maybe to come back. Of course, back I just think I think um, I, you, I, I wanted to answer your question by saying I'm, I'm very mm -hmm. confident that we, you know, the, these are these are very exciting roles. That that particular role, but also I think people stepping up to uh, board of creative Scotland. The, the uh, I. I have no doubt, as somebody who lives in Scotland, that there are people who can fill those roles. Um, and I think, I think the timetable, I think, you know, what's being proposed, as Kenny said, it's, uh, you know, if, uh, for some of us it does feel like <clears throat> we're sort of going back 20 years, but, you know, this, the time, time is very ripe. And I think that the proposals are arriving at a moment where I, I don't think the timetable is impossible by any means, because we all know what needs to happen. We all, we all want this to happen. So I think there has to be a certain <coughs> element of uh, belief and confidence, which perhaps is lacking sometimes. You know, we need to, we need to be more confident about this. I just, it's weird. How can the committee have leverage with the television industry? That's the nub of the thing that we have to get into. <coughs> because in television, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. So if the commissioner says, this is what we want, and this is how we want it, then everybody goes like that and makes it with that in mind. So the casualties of that in terms of Scotland will be they won't use Scottish actors because there are no names, even though they'll be good enough. They, it'll be a generic setting. Uh, it'll be set in Edinburgh, but it could be set anywhere. The story will be kind of, you know, somewhere in the middle. It won't be culturally specific. And, and, and so how... if if, if, how can we get leverage in some way to go into an honest negotiation with the broadcasters where we are, we feel we can be uh, culturally represented as well as, you know, creating work? I think it can be two things. It can be both those things. And I think, I think there's a, an opportunity for this to develop with the new BBC channel, uh, even though it is the drama within it is at the risk of being ghettoised because of the amount of money they're spending on it. And we have to be careful that Scotland doesn't get seen as we fill the quota, but uh, it's only of a certain quality or a certain standard. Kenny, uh... did you want to come in? Yeah. Taking it back one step, I think. What was the, the task was how to get the public sector sorted out and its response to the needs and opportunities of the screen industries. And so I think the collaborative proposal, as it's called, I think is a major achievement, having worked in this industry for too long uh, and had been very frustrated at different times in trying to get public bodies like Scottish Enterprise and others around the table, the fact they've all signed up to this, I think, is a major achievement. So I don't think there's any disagreement from that side, I think it's picking up John's point that we've got the design, um, but it's now about the implementation. And it is about the, the body itself, the screen unit itself, won't solve everything. It's merely the public sector's uh, response to those needs and opportunities. But it absolutely has to have core relationships with the BBC, Channel 4, other broadcasters, international platforms like Amazon and Netflix. Um, and this for the first time in, in my time working back in Scotland, I actually feel confident that it might work, which is for me quite a major step forward. Um, but it does come back to the people that end up being appointed into these posts. It ends <coughs> up that the, and the, the reason we've been focusing a bit, which you were taking as negative, it's more how do we make it better, uh, is around governance. And key questions like, how is it free to take the decisions it needs to take in timescales that are sensible? Um, and getting and having five public sector bodies sat around a table potentially being involved in taking those decisions does not give me confidence that that would be a good thing. 
So it's how do we create a governance structure that allows that freedom for those wonderful people who are going to come and do this job to actually do the job that they're paid to do. Um, and the leverage point, I think, is spot on. In the past, previous iterations of this had responsibility in this territory but didn't have the, the money to do it and didn't have the mandate, the full mandate to do it. Whereas the screen unit as set out has the mandate, has the money, um, and is charged with making this work. And I think that's where the timing inevitably won't work to the 1st of April. Um, but it's a case of how quickly can we get it up and running and how do we ensure it works to the best of its ability. So I think there are lots of bigger issues. The relationship with broadcasters is a huge one and has been there forever. But by <coughs> this is the public sector response to that and I think it, it, it bodes well. Thank you. Philip, Philip, did you want to come in? Yes, I, I'd, uh, I'd very much agree with what's just been said by Ken and, and before him by John. Um, I, I think getting the design of the new unit right is absolutely crucial. And when I read the paperwork and I see 12 action points, I think that's fine and well. But uh, where are the priorities and what is fundamental? And uh, I'm, I'm not at all clear that that's found its way through into the thinking. Um, I think that uh, if we look forward, um, we're, we're, at a, we're at a period of really maximum change in a highly competitive internal UK market, let alone uh, the rest of the world. And I'm not clear where the understanding of current trends and future prospects is going to be situated in, in the screen unit. Um, we've got new distribution systems, new devices, new, de new audience demographics, new challenges to sustaining national content because there are ambiguities of dealing in the global marketplace. Um, and new threats, I think, to the uh, future of public service broadcasting, which so much is being hung on in, in this discussion. Um, and uh, also questions to be asked about the, the current structure of tax reliefs, for example, and who, who actually benefits uh, from, from that in terms of the UK marketplace as opposed to uh, mainly US players. So I, I think within the forward thinking, there really needs to be some kind of research capability. <coughs> Uh, and there also needs to be a set of strategic priorities which is different from a set of action points. Um, and uh, I, uh, I think also, obviously, working in a university, thinking through uh, the relationships with Scottish institutions is, is really important. And when I see um, film identified as the focus, and I think, well, as has been said, it's not just about film, it's actually about screen industries and the transforming relationships between production, distribution and consumption that we need to get up to speed on. I think that too needs to be addressed in um, a different kind of way. How is this going to be informed by evidence and strategy? And um, I'll, just, I'll just pause there because I'm, I, I really think if that's not inscribed into the future of the unit right at the beginning, that's going to be a problem. Otherwise, I would completely agree that this is a public sector solution to a problem. And what has not been addressed is actually how you might access finance that is not in the public sector. And very, very difficult, as people know, but it's something that does need to be discussed at least. Otherwise, everything falls back into the same place and uh, it gets parceled out. Uh, and when it gets parceled out, uh, people fall uh, between the cracks, I think. And um, Tavish Scott. Uh, thank you very much. I, I actually wanted uh, to just quickly ask that question again about um, the trends in the industry because it seems to have been a very BBC, forgive me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be a very BBC discussion so far. All our kids are watching Netflix and lots of other things on tablets and so on and so forth. They don't hardly watch a telly these days. It, will this unit, does this unit have the ability to take that into account in terms of how we actually consume the marketplace that is the media nowadays? I mean, I think, well, uh, quick answer from my end. Yes, because this is addressing, I mean, this is a this is a golden opportunity for uh, well 
for us makers because content is, you know, the platforms are all changing and all of that is true, but the, the demand for content is still there and is, you know, increasing. Um, I think, you know, the only reason that we, we talk about those structures like the BBC is not, I mean, it's perfectly true to say that we're going elsewhere for those funding, but I think that we do have, um, you know, there's still quite a significant uh, co, I mean, a lot of the things that you might be, <laughs> children might be watching on tablets are going to be in some way co-funded with BBC. I mean, the yeah. way in which these things are happening. So, uh, uh, yes, it, let's not get stuck on the BBC, but mm. the, um, I think that's sort of shorthand for, uh, as Kenny puts it, you know, the, 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 the problem of leverage, really, and the problem of being in a situation and somehow to convert, because I think, picking up on your point, that you know, this is a time of opportunity. I think the fact that, and as Philip points out rightly, you know, we need to be keeping a very clear sense of ongoing research on how these things are changing. But everything is changing. I mean, the film business is in complete turmoil at the moment because, you know, because our children watch, my children watch everything on the, online. Mm. They don't go to cinemas mm. uh, unless it's a very particular kind of product. So there is so much turmoil, and I think that represents has to represent opportunity rather than chaos. <laughs> uh, and I think the screen, I think what's very, very positive about the proposals is that they are framed in a way that allows that breadth and allows for that sense of change. The times are changing. And I think it's This is a fundamental problem about for, for freelancers working in the industry. It's a fast changing industry, jobs are changing. And what do you mean by freelancers? Um, so people will go from production to okay. production. Yeah. Um, they, they. They don't work for one. They they move with. Yes. So they're moving yeah. from production to production. Yeah. One of, uh, and it is a major problem. Something that, the, you will be debating later about training, but crew capacity, um, the crew working in Scotland have to have access to training and also new techniques, new skills, because things are changing all the time. I think there's um, one of the things that, that I see is really positive is the, this idea of data collection. And it could feed into Philip's suggestion about research. One of the, the problems that, that we've had is actually collecting data to know who's working on what, what and what kind of things people are watching. All these things are relevant. Um, there hasn't been capacity in Creative Scotland to collect that kind of data, but what we need is, you know, that needs to be built in to the screen. It is very boring collecting data. It won't be an exciting job, but it does form the, the basis for research, and it does mean that you know who uh, the, the facilities companies that need to be um, invested in, the, the crew that have been working on a production and realised their, their skills are out of date. These are the things that we need to be mindful of because at the moment there is, that is not happening. So this is, again, a good opportunity. Richard Lockyer, did you want to come in? <clears throat> it strikes me since the evolution in 1999 we've been attempting over and over to get this right. <laughs> and whilst other sectors have prospered with the evolution... Uh, we've not quite achieved our potential with the screen sectors, unfortunately. So clearly, hopefully, this is a turning point. But I do get concerned when I see all the public agencies that are involved and how we talk about collaboration. And I just wanted to know what your views were in terms of how we can ensure that the public agencies are genuinely focused on the screen sectors and that the individual from Skills Development Scotland or Helens and Ellis Enterprise or the Scottish Funding Council or Scottish Development International or Scottish Enterprise are not just viewing the screen unit as a 10 a.m. Wednesday morning appointment in a few weeks' time. They're actually totally focused on this. Right, that's what we have to interrogate and, and, uh, in our discussions over the next few weeks uh, within Creative Scotland. Because on the one hand, um, if that group, on one hand you would say, if that group were not created, considering the problem about the dysfunctional relationship between them and the fragmentation, so at least there's now a group where they sit around the table, <coughs> to say that's the solution to everything, it certainly isn't. Um, it will be a contributory factor to making sure that communication between those agencies take place. That could be a world away from 
strategic development, um, momentum, uh, support to the leadership team, making sure that deals are happened, leveraging funding and all of that. So that's a part of the solution. It may be a small part, it may be a bigger part, but in bringing the Creative Scotland directors onto it and people from the industry, there may be a possibility to make that work, but I share your concern that um, it could be, as you say, a meeting at 10 o'clock to attend once a quarter, um, and I'd be very, very keen to see who the representatives are who come from uh, the different organisations and are sent to that. It's fine if the Chief Executive of Creative Scotland is there in a key role, but the priority the other public agencies give to it, considering their focus is not the screen, and the, for example, the Funding Council or uh, uh, whatever, they've got other bigger issues in another part of the, uh, the territory in Scotland, but to make sure that their contribution is focused on the screen industry, and I think that's the things we have to interrogate and work out, and if it needs to be, there needs to be other tweaks to the, the governance structure, then we have to see where so that there's a strategic development, there's momentum and support to the leadership team in terms of developing strategy and helping them to make the international context and do whatever they can do um, to, to make it happen. So it's part of the solution, bringing them around the table, but it's just a start. <coughs> to pick up, I mean, it's no accident, excuse me, <coughs> that um, you mentioned devolution, and it seems to me that you know we are, you know, we are living with the legacy of broadcasting having been. Uh, part of, you know, the, the, the framing of devolution was that broadcasting was taken out of the uh, devolved powers, and I think, you know, we're living with that. Uh, I don't know if that can change. I'd love, when you said those words, I thought, oh gosh, maybe maybe that can be changed. <laughs> well, it can be, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, that would be a good thing. I think, I suppose, the thing about that is that if we, because I think it is about strategy, I think it's about, and, and picking up on Tavish's point too, I think the question we have to say to ourselves is, do we want to think because clearly the ambition here is to do that. Do we want to think strategically about creating an environment in Scotland where, as in other countries, such as Denmark, or we talk Wales and Northern Ireland to, a, to some extent, where there is a clear both commercial and cultural infrastructure that exists indigenously creating programmes, whether they're on Amazon or Netflix or anything else. That's not happening here, and the reason that we bring, the, you know, the new channel is mentioned in Scotland. You know, there is an issue about the fact if we have a new channel that is being created in Scotland and it is not properly connected to whatever infrastructure we're going to have, which in 20 years' time, because we need to be thinking in terms of we just made reference to 20 years and devolution, you know, what, what, what do we want in 20 years' time? Well, what we really want is that indigenous screen culture. We want all those shows that we all watch on Netflix to be coming from here. We want people to identify here, not simply as a location where you can come, get some good scenery, and a little bit of cash in your pocket from the screen unit. That's, that's the problem. We don't want that. We want to be creating from the inside. And I think that requires, that requires strategic thinking. And you can't do that without dealing with, um, well, it's, the public sector's as Ken, Ken said, is you know this is the part of it. But we, yes, we do need to bring in, as Philip says, we need to think about all uh, you know uh, non-public money. But we also we can't avoid thinking about the new Scottish Channel and, and other you know the, these. That's all part of the same. You know, we're, we're in this small country, and that's. I, I, it, I mean, the only final point I would make is that there is a sense of urgency. I was reading how Netflix are commissioning $8 billion worth of content in 2018, which is eye-watering, and that's just one company. Mm -hmm. And I tear my hair out thinking my Scotland not in a really fantastic position to grab a huge chunk mm -hmm. of that, albeit we've done well in some areas and are improving. I just, can you give us an assurance that we're not going to turn around in a year's time and the goodwill we had with the public sector agencies turned out not to deliver? and we're going to have to revisit that. Should there not be co-location of their staff with the screen unit or dedicated staff within those public agencies who work full-time in the screen sectors? <laughs> <laughs> if they've got the right skills and they will bring benefit, then of course. I think you asked about Netflix and the, sort of, and the Northern Ireland example there earlier was, uh, obviously Northern Ireland's made its name in the last few years with Game of Thrones. And my, my question, for the committee to consider is, does the screen unit make it possible with the next Game of Thrones equivalent? Would Scotland have any chance of getting that commission? I think, I 
And sorry. Uh, I, I think it's an important question, and um, what's absent, I think, from the vision is uh, any sort of sense of what's Scotland going to specialise in that will give it a particular kind of leverage within the global marketplace. And um, there is, within the, uh, within the proposal, um, an idea of growing larger companies, but it, it's not clear what those companies are going to be. And uh, in some respects, while I wouldn't dissent from it, I think the conglomeration in the marketplace is going on at such a pace that even larger companies would, uh, five years down the line, would not solve the problem because everything will have relatively moved on. So I think it, it, it's, it's, it, while we have to think about what we're dealing with now, and public service broadcasting is very important in, in that respect, the point you were making about uh, the scale of commissioning out with public service broadcasting, which is international and uh, uh, going to global marketplaces, really dwarfs the, the means at our disposal. So I think, I think where we have to start is thinking in those terms and trying to think creatively beyond them. Because if we get obsessed with what is here now, we're going to get um, into a complete stall, I would say. Thank you. Jackson Carlo. I think, actually, a lot of the points that I was trying to bring out are coming out now, and I'm just intrigued. I mean, when the screen sector uh, proposal emerged as a result of the inquiry that began in 2015, um, really these international streaming services were still something of a blink in people's eye. I mean, I think it was, oh, that's the promise of the future. But we were obviously intrigued when we visited Ward Park Studios, £330 million worth of investment over three years from Sony Television. Um, and what was the catalyst that we could produce high quality drama and have proven we can at a third less than it could be produced in the United States? And it seems to me that that is the selling point. What we saw there were hundreds of Scots being employed in the carpentry shop, in the wardrobe shop, in the painting and decorating shop, in the set building and in the production. And so what we saw really was the emergence of a genuine Scottish film studios and an interesting commentary from Sony Television that when Outlander reaches its natural conclusion, there is now a, a, a film studio set built in Scotland that they have confidence in being capable of delivering future production. And so I guess my question is, will this uh, set, the, the, screen, the, the screen unit, be fleet of foot in terms of its ability to move beyond, because all my life it was about the BBC uh, or ITV, and uh, you know we then all watched the product. I mean, I'm gobsmacked by the fact that Outlander is the most watched drama production by women anywhere in the world, and actually nobody in Scotland really knows anything about it. So we're almost moving into an era, era where there is a huge sector that can employ people, but which people might not actually watch in this country. It could actually be that it's watched everywhere else, but it's a huge opportunity for Scotland. And it's that whole dynamic that I just want to understand. Will it be fleet of foot enough to look at that? And from the committee's point of view, we can summon the BBC here. Uh, we can, we've had STV and ITV along. I don't know how we get Sony Pictures, Netflix, and Amazon Prime to come here that we can interrogate. So in that sense of interaction, does the expertise exist within Scotland and the potential screen unit? And how do we try to engage in a way, as I can think it only is going to grow, as Richard has said, for us to try and grab... I mean, I understand studio capacity as a feature in all of this, because they have to be able to go somewhere to do it. But how do we uh, influence, you know, given that we've got that record now and the ability to produce at a lower cost, will this unit... I mean, I don't want to find in five years' time that this, the screen unit has ended up having a five-year row with the BBC um, over whether or not we've got up to 43% or 42% of what they are producing when the rest of the world is burgeoning all around us and we've missed another boat. I think you're absolutely right about that. It's companies at that level are probably not really going to talk to the screen unit. They decide, they have people looking at exchange rates all the time. They know exactly the cost of everything to be filmed anywhere in the world. It's such a global market. 
I mean, it'd be nice if the screen unit were fleet enough and sassy enough that they could actually get ahead of this. But really, if you're talking about Sony, they'll, they'll come here and shoot because they've got the facilities. I mean, to bring up what Chris was talking about, what we don't want is to create enough of a production fund that other people are coming in in order to spend our money with no guarantees of any local talent mm -hmm. um, being used. That, I think that would be slightly unfortunate. It would be, there would be spend in Scotland, but we wouldn't have any kind of cultural legacy or um, professional legacy in terms of people getting work on productions. But if we're, if we're talking about Netflix, Netflix are not going to want to the production funding, this is, you know, 10 million. We think it's a lot, but they don't think it's a lot. So I would sort of get, I, I would just think, I'd be very grateful that Sony would still be considering working in Scotland, but I don't think we have any influence over whether Sony do that or not. I think, uh, I think in terms of all these uh, big studios like Amazon, Netflix, uh, they are, that's, it's only in our imagination that they may come here. They'll only come here because they can make a profit. Yeah. If they, if, that's the only reason they'll come here, for no other reason. Uh, that's not a bad it, reason. It's, it's inevitable, yeah, but it's, but it's out there in the ether. Mm. You cannot help but talk about the BBC because they are here. Mm -hmm. They're staying here. They're part of the landscape. So you, you cannot help that. That has to become a, a, a kind of major factor, discussion point. I mean, I what, what, what we need to do is think about why we aren't creating the outlander, because, you know, what do they have that we don't have? Because it's just ideas, it's stories. They've just taken, I mean, it's, you know, it's the old Jacobite stuff. God, we all had it at school drummed into us. So, you know, what we have to be thinking, and that's why I come back to this strategic thing, well, you know, it's not changed. The markets, the platforms time. change, but we need to be planning, and we haven't, you know, we've lost another 20 years because the Danish, if you take that as an example, spent a lot of time getting to a point where they do have some of the best writers in the world, and everyone's copying their, or, you know, the Israelis in terms of, uh, you know, Homeland or whatever. It, it's, it all comes down, what's so attractive about this business in terms of making money for people is that it does come down to ideas. So what we have to say is, how can we create the environment in Scotland where outlanders are being made of all shapes and sizes, not just by Sony for Sony's profit, but by companies based in Scotland, maybe delivering them to Sony or Netflix or other platforms, because in the end, these guys all want to do business. As Kenny says, it's just about making money. We can make money for them, but the problem at the moment is that we're, we're putting ourselves at, at, at the lowest possible point of that, which is just effectively cheap labor. What we want to be doing is originating. And, and that's, I agree, I don't want to talk about the BBC about that, but the thing is that in terms of resources, in terms of long-term long strategic thinking, yeah, a public broadcaster or Channel 4 or other outfits, they do have deep pockets and there are ways in which they could seriously collaborate with public sector units to strategically provide a situation in five or ten years' time where we are generating those kind of massive global shows. No reason for us not to do it. <laughs> you know, I, I think, uh, following Mr. Carlos' point, that the, uh, what, and what uh, Chris has said, that within the screen unit proposal is that priority on helping to build the business base. Uh, I think that's crucially important. It comes out of what um, Bell and Chris said, so that we do have uh, more boots on the ground, more productions on the ground, and so we can be built so that they uh, is very, very uh, fragile at the moment. Yeah. It's we also a lot about content development, like screenwriting capacity yeah. and things like that. Is, is that the right focus? Yeah, thing? yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they've got this it's so, it's so multifaceted to make sure that the crews get enough work to stay in Scotland, develop their skills in Scotland, and having to do a, do a film here and then go to London or Birmingham or Paris to do the next thing. So there's enough work going around so people can make the choice to develop their careers in Scotland at every level. Of creative, of creative development, but getting the companies built, and I think uh, colleagues on the second panel could go into that in uh, more detail about the company development and what needs to happen to make sure that the small companies become bigger and the ambitions that are in uh, the screen unit proposal are uh, seen to be not uh, unrealistic. Um, 
but the, the company base has got to be built, and then you can take the opportunity that comes with Netflix and Amazon, because these new delivery models need content, and we can deliver a lot of content. So there are more opportunities there. It's not you're not stuck to the two, two or three public service broadcasters and the odd feature film. You've got these people who need a lot of content and are very keen on Scotland. A lot of them they know it, and if we can match into the create the screen unit, the kind of people they want to talk to, who can make the sort of decisions quickly that can help them to come here and tip something over so that the next Game of Thrones or whatever it is doesn't go to Northern Ireland but goes here. It's having people that people can talk to. When people say to me, people have said to me around the UK, when we go to, um, if we look up making film in Wales, or making film in Northern Ireland, we've got a website, an open door and a list of contacts. We don't get that when we, we don't quite know. We've got to know that Creative Scotland exists, and then we've got to go in, and then we've got to find a link into that. So there, there this is an open door, I, as it says. I'm glad you raised that, because there was a commitment some time ago that we would have a portal. Now, I know that wasn't the remit of your, your screen sector leadership group. Somebody else was doing that. Um, it's still not being delivered. No, I'm a a one-stop shop. It. Have you, has anybody heard what's happening with that? I would like to see that there by the, new, by the time the new screen unit is up and running and it's modelled and whatever. Prize, who were doing that? Ah. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you can't. So there's, there's some basic things that need to be done, but what we need to do is make sure that people who want to develop and invest in Scotland, develop the business, can phone somebody, text somebody and say, can you help me? What do I need to do about this? And that's not there at the moment. The screen unit knows that. The people who've designed this know that's necessary. And it's got to be at every level, some basic levels from website and the way they discuss to each other through to uh, working with the industry and the international players to find out what they need and what they want. And that's why the appointment of leadership team and why the governance and accountability is so crucial to get that right so the right questions can be asked. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll have a brief suspension to move to our second uh, panel of witnesses. And I'm aware that not all members have had the opportunity to uh, ask questions in this first panel. So I'll make sure that members who haven't had that opportunity in the first session will uh, get that opportunity in the second session. So I'll just briefly suspend and thank our witnesses for coming today. Thank you.
Uh, I'd now like to welcome to the meeting our second panel of witnesses, Ian Smith, Chair of the British Film Commission, David Smith, the National Representative for Scotland of PACT, Claire Kerr, the producer at Meadcare, Wendy Griffin, the producer at Selkie Productions Limited, uh, Tommy Gormley, who's the first assistant director, and Fiona Miller of the Association for, Supporters, for Supporting Artists Agents in Scotland. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for giving us your time today. Uh, some of you will have heard the points made by the previous panel, um, in particular around uh, commissioning, fragmentation, and whether um, we've got the new screen unit uh, right in terms of governance. And I just wondered whether you had any uh, reflections that you wanted to make on that evidence before we move on to specific questions. Uh, Fiona Miller. Thank you very much. Um, the Association of Scotting, Scottish Casting Agents thanks you for being here today and I hope that you've seen our submission to the inquiry. What's really key for us and in, for to be quick I'm going to just say some bullet points about what we'd like to feedback about the a collaboration strategy in that, um, first of all, there's not enough funding. Local government was awarded £170 million recently, really around pay rises. We need £170 million and we'll double that through jobs, investment, etc. It doesn't reflect back to me the position of practitioners. I don't hear, see or feel anything in it that represents my experience in the industry. We need to refresh, redo and engage everybody from bottom to top to redo the collaboration proposal. Collaboration is not enough. I've been working in the public sector for 15 years around community planning and community planning didn't work and it took them 12 to 15 years to work that out. And in order to make the public sector bodies work, they had to bring in legislation. 12 years is too late. We've already missed the boat. And my concern is that, and it was quite clear that Creative Scotland found it hard to engage in a community planning agenda, as did Scottish Enterprise. They also find it difficult to work at a strategic level. So we need legislation. We know that public sector reform has been challenging. And in order to make the bodies work together and pool resources, we needed that legislation. And I think we need that legislation. We don't need a collaborative approach. It's proven and there's evidence there to show it doesn't work. It's not ambitious enough. Five to eight dramas between 20 to 23 is not enough. There's over five to eight dramas at the moment. It's not fast enough. 12 months to come up with an action plan for a studio is too late. And six months to come up with a business case also is too late. Those time to take scales will make sure that we continue to fall behind. And in terms of my last point, I think there's two issues in collaboration. There's one about the one I've just drawn your attention to, which is the fact that the public sector bodies historically find it difficult, so we need to deal with that. But we also need to recognise that this is a commercial interest. This is about making money. This is about making Scotland and telling Scotland we're open for business. Thank you. That was very clear. Uh, Tommy <coughs> Gormley. Hey, <coughs> I'd like to start by saying uh, thank you for letting me be here today. <coughs> I suppose I'm the classic wandering Scot that actually works in the film business day by day after day, and I've travelled the planet doing so. And uh, I think we haven't just missed a boat in this country, we've missed an entire fleet. It's, uh, it's cataclysmic. Mm -hmm. It's a cataclysmic failure at every level yep. to deliver. The fact that the production spend in Scotland is, is catastrophically low compared to the UK. It's, it's a disgrace. We're 8.5% of the UK population. What's the spend? 3.54%. I don't know the exact figures. It's well less than half what it should be. So several things that I'd like to say briefly. Uh, it's, a, it's called a film business for a reason. It's a business, a hard-headed financial business. It always has been, always will be. It's very fluid. It goes wherever there's facilities and there's a crew. That's what draws films, facilities and crew. Uh, we, had, we have a great crew in Scotland, not enough. But I think it's, uh, from my own experience working in every film I've worked around the world, there was always a little coterie of Scots working there. And it's got slightly smaller in the last few years. I've noticed there was always, you know, eight, nine, 12 Scots on the crew. Now there's four, five, seven. There's less skilled crew, and my experience on the films I work on. I, I left a film studio last night to come here, almost missed a plane to get here from a film studio. I'm going back tonight to a, a film studio to start working tomorrow morning. 
Uh, I think there's a great misunderstanding, uh, it's, and even in, the, in Creative Scotland and, and Scottish Enterprise, what, actually, what filmmaking involves. It's a very simple industrial process. It has its own little factory. It needs the factory. You lovely MSPs have this amazing building. You come to work in the morning to this building. Mm -hmm. I've got a job. I leave house at 6 a.m. Where do I go? I go to a film studio. It's not rocket science. We can't spend every day filming up in... Uh, we can't spend every day in Glencoe doing scenery. You need a film studio. It's, 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 it's not rocket science. It's very simple. We don't have to build a Rolls-Royce Pinewood in Scotland. It can be a very small scale, simple. It can be, it can be several facilities. It could be whatever. It, it could be anything would help. It's just the, the, the lack of a studio is, is crippling, I think. It has been when I first ventured abroad 25 years ago, and it's been discussed endlessly, and it still is today. It's a good saying in drama that all character is action. It's not what someone says that matters in films or TV. It's what they do. All character is action, and the lack of action has been staggering, in my opinion, in our industry over the last, over the last many, many, many years. I, why, why is it important that the, the previous incumbents at, at, at uh, Creative Scotland were rather scathing about the studio needs? We don't need a big, shiny studio, was one comment I remember from previous times. What happens is when you make a film, it starts with two or three people, a location manager, a production designer, the director, a producer, they get in a room and they start discussing where they're going to be, where they're going to, how they're going to do it, how they're going to hire a crew, <coughs> the crew gets hired there. So if you come for three weeks from Glasgow filming or you come to do Avengers in Edinburgh last year, what matters is where the project is generated from, because that's where you hire the crew. You say, oh, we'll hire him, him and him, and he's a great prop guy and she's a great designer and we'll get these people together. And when you go for three weeks to Scotland, you bring them with you because it's a no-brainer, because you know them, trust them, you've hired them, you know what they can do. That's how it works. So wherever the project is based is where the crew are hired. That's a critical misunderstanding of it's not about big some shiny studio with nice windows and desks. It's about where the human beings all sit and meet and discuss and like you folks do in the parliament. Where you meet is where the work is generated from. So I've got a bugbear about the studio for a starter. It's also 80% of the work, I work, I've worked in 54 feature films around the world. 80% of it is done in a studio. That's how films are made because it rains sometimes or it's cloudy or it's too cold or whatever it is. It's not, it's not some fantasy that, you know, it's, a studio is... It's not, it's not, it doesn't solve every problem. It doesn't create content. What I think we need, and there's, there's, there's two strands to me, there's a content piece which uh, my dear friends Ken and Chris spoke very well about is very important. Of course, we have to generate local content. They're two disparate things, but they can run in tandem. We can create local content, and I think one feeds the other. If there is an infrastructure, guess what? You get little groups of people together, and you start creating content, and companies can just grow and develop. So they're not... They're not mutually exclusive. They're slightly different areas, developing content and the infrastructure, but they can feed into each other, I believe. So I think that it's vital that, and it's wonderful, what we've done at Ward Park tells the story. It's fantastic, it's wonderful. We missed the boat with uh, Game of Thrones. Remember, the pilot was shot in Scotland. Some smarter folk than us in Northern Ireland were smart about how to, what to offer, studio-wise, facility-wise, and they got the biggest TV show in history to go to Northern Ireland for the last seven years and hundreds of millions of pounds because they were smarter than us and we missed the boat there. And it's going to keep on happening because I feel there's a lack of ambition and drive and the people in those, in the jobs at Creative Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, I think they're not really from the hard end of production. They don't really understand how films are made or why they're made or what the process is. And I think we'll continue to miss the boat until we have a film studio and we have people at the top of the, of the quangos who actually are filmmakers and not people who, uh, who like to practice it? Who like you. to? Thank you very here. much. I'm going to bring in Mary Gujon now. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, um, uh, just to pick up from that, I, and <laughs> I don't know exactly how to do that, but really, it was just in terms of the the knowledge that you you say that is needed. Uh, at the moment in terms of that filmmaking expertise and people who are involved in the day-to-day -day working of the industry. Um, do you think that... Th do you think that that knowledge and that expertise will be there? Have you been given any sort of reassurance that... Um, we heard from the last panel, obviously, that they want to see people from film, people from television. Um, do you think that that will be there? And I think it will exist. I think it's a danger of losing it because it's basically... It's one of those jobs you only get knowledge by doing it. It's quite hard. I think the best training is on-the-job training. Also, I think to bear in mind is people... It's not quite divisive. It's film, it's TV, it's this, it's that. Film and TV drama are totally synonymous now. The, the, the quality levels on Outlander, Game of Thrones... If you walked onto a film set and it was Game of Thrones or it was a movie, you'd have no idea. They look identical. 
It's the same assistant director, it's the same costume guy. The jobs are identical because they're, they're now pitched at such a high level, the quality is so high. So, and high-end TV drama is, is actually the great new thing, is what we should be chasing more than anything, probably. And then the films will come as well. The, the, the skill of the crew, like Outlander, is developing a massive, a, a great crew base of skilled personnel. But I think by the moment, uh, I, I, people could speak better than me, I think we, we would struggle to, more than two or three films in Scotland or big TV shows, there's not the crew here and the crew have to be imported. And it's, it's a, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more work we do, the more, the more skilled crew we'll have. Mm -hmm. And that in turn attracts people to come to Scotland, because as Ian Smith will tell you, films come, it's, you know, it's, what does it cost? Uh, what's the tax break? How do we, it's a very hard-headed business decision. And having a skilled crew, not to have to import crew and put them up in hotels, is very attractive. And I'd also ask, the, I, I'm doing, I don't know, with, with the new tax raising powers, what's made Britain, the UK, so attractive? I work, in, I work in Hollywood movies all the time around the world. I lived in Los Angeles for seven years. I came back to the UK because all the big movies are back here suddenly. Why are they back here? They've got the facilities, they've got a highly skilled crew, maybe the best in the world, and they've got a very uh, beneficial tax rebate. And that is why, if it would go tomorrow, if that changed, it would go away tomorrow. It's got the crew, the facilities and the tax rebates. So why don't we look for a clever way of Scotland getting a bit of that action? Are we allowed to take an extra 1% in the film and TV tax rebate? That would be a game changer. If we took one more percent and suddenly, if because the folk like Ian sit in London and do the, look at the accounts and say, oh, we can save two and a half million by shooting us in Edinburgh or Glasgow or wherever, guess what? They'll go on a, they'll go on a New York second. So that's what we just, just, just for clarity, in case anybody's expectations go up, I know the tax breaks are entirely uh, reserved uh, to Westminster. Mm -hmm. But David Smith, I think... Oh, we should get them back. David Smith wanted to, <laughs> <laughs> wanted to come in. <laughs> I just want to say that uh, I work in an entirely different industry, I feel. Uh, I actually feel a bit of a, a, a ringer in this kind of mix, in that I don't work in drama, I don't work in scripted of, of any kind. I think you've probably all been in more studios than I have been uh, in my time. I work in factual television production which is now and remains the majority of the turnover and employment in the Scottish sector. Um, I hear um, the, the points made, I agree with the point made, uh, in terms of the importance of the studio. I think it is something we have lacked for a long time and, and very much need. But I think we, we lose sight and very much reflecting on your original question, which was what are the points from the previous session, session that I think are worth picking up on? And also within the screen unit proposal, what are the things that are missing? So IP, the, the ownership of ideas, is, is vital. It's the, it's the mechanism of production. You know, so in, in whatever sphere you're in, if it's scripted or non-scripted, if you own the IP, then you have the levers of power. Currently, we don't have the levers of power. In my world, which is television and factual non-scripted production, up to 2003, the Communications Act, producers didn't own their IP. It was owned by the broadcasters. You worked on a for hire model. Um, the change came when the Communications Act delivered IP back to producers who were then able to exploit it. Many, many companies were successfully built on that. They, there's an exponential rise in, in terms of the growth of the TV sector within the UK, particularly in the, the non-scripted side, but also very much in London in the scripted side. What happened in Scotland was slightly different in that we became a place for outsourcing. So production was displaced here. Um, whether it was in, uh, scripted or non-scripted, you ended up with lots of projects being lifted and shifted to Scotland. There's value in that, there's, there's good value in that, but it's not as valuable as owning the IP. So it was really useful in the previous session to hear Chris and others talk about the, the, the primacy of ideas, and I think that's something that we need to get back to. In the screen unit proposal, if you, uh, when I read it, I hear lots of talk about the importance of skills and crew, and I don't deny those things, but I think there is a development skill that we need to kind of focus upon. If you don't get development right, then nothing else happens. You become work for hire, you become guns for hire in, in the system. That was important. Um, I also <laughs> thought the point about companies and how they grow um, goes back to IP. If you don't have the right idea, you never grow. So IWC Media, which is a company based in Glasgow where I worked for a while, grew because location, location, location was an idea that sold and sold and sold. Um, careers were built on the back of it. Uh, many careers, many companies have been spun out from it. Uh, it all goes back to that one idea. IWC didn't grow because it was IWC, it grew because it made that location, location, location. And that's what we need to return the focus to, I feel. Um, and then, go, again, looking back at the previous session uh, and going back to the original question, um, I had lots of points to make about governance. I think they've all been made. Uh, I think the, the role of the industry within that governance structure needs to be um, given great consideration. I think that 
at present the two industry reps that work within that governance structure are both from the scripted side of the business and I'd like to see a role for non-scripted in that mix. Okay, thanks very much. Um, is it, Wendy, did you want to come in? No, um, no I would uh, agree with a lot of um, okay. well, okay. stuff that was said earlier and also what... Um, uh, uh, we're just saying there that I, I just think that it is about a, a lot of it is about developing ideas, and I think that what's quite hard um, with small companies is how you how you survive while you're doing that. Actually, so I think um, funds for development are crucial as well as all the other things that everyone's mentioned. And Claire, yeah, um, in terms of the screen unit and how it's and how it's run, getting back to that, the and who staffs it and, and who's there and who's committed to it. In, in Denmark, they use a system where industry producers work within their screen unit and they have the job for only three years and then they go back to doing what they did before and what they get from accessing, they get access to international contacts while they're doing that and they bring those contacts back into the workplace. So it feels like a really useful revolving door, that I, a model that I think Scotland could look at and use the talent that we have there, but make sure that, they're only, that they're, there's a fixed term for, for that job. And, 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 and perhaps you need to have people from both factual and drama sitting within the screen unit to make sure that the work that's being done and the, the way that they engage with the industry is, is realistic and relevant. And also, then they'd have a vested interest in building an industry they want to back, walk back out into, rather than staying in a job which is very comfortable when the rest of us are actually living in relatively risky times most of the time. So I think, and we have got two, we've got two tracks running in Scotland. We have to keep, as Tommy says, we have to keep making sure that we can attract the high-end business that we're going to need to build an amazing industry. But we also have to make sure, as everyone else has pointed out, that our indigenous um, IP is, is being nurtured. But that'll, that'll take, that, that's all about th th those people getting access to the broadcasters. And just in the break, I was talking there about the fact that Outlander's been here for about five years now, and there's lots of training going on in Outlander, but I don't know who from Scotland has access to the execs at Outlander, who understands what the showrunner does, who's had... And I know you'll be doing a training, there's, there's training to be looked at by, by another committee, but I think when you have these big shows here, perhaps what the screen unit can be doing is talking to them about... Um, new producers, or maybe not that new producers, but producers who've not yet had the chance to see how a machine like that is working at script level, or Scottish writers. Are there any Scottish writers working on Outlander yet? We don't know. I don't know. But, um, and it's hard to tell. They may well be. I'm not saying there's not, but it, because I don't know what's going on there. But when those big shows come, finding out how we access the upper echelons, if they're going to be here for five, six, seven, eight years, that's a fantastic opportunity. Um, I, I met a, a young a producer from England who uh, is now working for Netflix because of, he had a job on a feature film with someone who then bumped on to the exec of a show. He'd impressed him as a, as a young uh, producer slash line producer. Those connections are really important, but I feel we're making lots of connections in the um, technical level, but we're not making many connections in the IP level. And I think if the screen unit could be engaged in that, it would be really useful. Okay. Uh, I'd like to bring in Rachel Hamilton. Morning. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a point that John McCormack made about the dysfunctional relationship between um, Scottish Enterprise and Creative Scotland. Um, Creative Scotland say that they will lead activity in key new areas, particularly business development support for those companies that don't have high growth potential. And the ambition seems to set out that... Um, the collaborative proposal will boost the number of production companies with a turnover greater than 10 million. Um, I'm particularly interested in how we will grow uh, smaller productions and regional growth. Um, and Creative Scotland also say that they're going to adopt a one front door approach. Um, I just wondered how you think that that will take into account these regional requirements. And is this the correct approach? When you see regional requirements, what is it that you... What do so, you, mean so um, you know, the, the uh, production capacity in, uh, that's on a smaller scale, mm -hmm. so not just the high-growth um, ambition okay. that, that um, the collaborative proposal sets out. Okay. I think certainly from our perspective and the amount of people that we can provide employment through uh, being supporting artists, we would be calling on, yeah, the high-end drama that people have spoken about, absolutely supportive of that, and we all supply to... Outlander, 
we're you know absolutely linked into that but we're looking for domestic plus or super domestic shows which are around the 1.4 million mark for example Grandchester <coughs> Peaky Blinders Broadchurch Silent Witness Silent Witness has just been commissioned for its series 22 and it sells across the world uh, certainly for Grandchester there's probably only five regions in the world that they can't see it and there's no reason why we can't do that here and that on, that runs in parallel with the indigenous stuff with the high end and also that what they call domestic plus and that will provide more employment as well for us so I think that's what we would be looking for okay. anyone else mm -hmm. uh, Ian Smith can I bring you in here thank you um, I'm here as the chair of the British Film Commission, but my day job is active producing internationally. Um, and another important credential is that I'm a Glaswegian, I have a home in Glasgow, and I vote in Scotland. Although I spent an undue amount of my time in London and in Los Angeles. The reason for mentioning that is I took the view a long time ago that I wanted to make what I would think of as real films. And, um, and I discovered after 10 years of working in Scotland that I was having a good old time, but I wasn't actually changing anything. I wasn't achieving anything. So I was drawn to London and then very quickly after that to Los Angeles. And I haven't earned a, I haven't earned a, a pound in 30, 40 years, actually. It's all been dollars. So I've been internationally oriented so it's kind of inevitable that I ended up chairing, as a voluntary position, chairing the British Film Commission. And it's taken 20 years to move the, the whole industry <coughs> into a position where we're now seeing the kind of numbers that were published just a week ago, which is over 3 billion in terms of inward investment film and high-end TV drama. So we are all about the business of underpinning the cultural objectives and the creative objectives within the UK as a whole, but underpinning that with an economic foundation that allows the industry to exist, quite frankly. So the, 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 the unit, I think, is a very, very good um, development. It's a very positive development and shows that there's been listing going on. And that the, the marriage of the uncomfortable marriage between art on the one side and, and creativity and um, art and money, if you like, on the other side, that that is a very un... And it's a very difficult um, relationship to maintain. We're doing it in, in the UK. And by, by the way, the British Film Commission exists for Scotland as much as it does for all the other nations. Um, we, what we're trying to do is to make sure that the, the underpinnings of the industry are state-of-the-art, that we understand technology. It's all about industrial intelligence. We have a unit of four people in Los Angeles whose sole job is to listen and to understand, and to go to all the Q&As, and to go to all the parties, and to do all that stuff, and to find out who's doing what at the, at the very early stages. Without that intelligence, we wouldn't have a fraction of the money that we're enjoying in this country. So the money we're enjoying in this country, if I look at a map of the UK, hugely to my frustration, I have to say that Scotland is underperforming compared to the other nations. Can I ask Northern why? Ireland and Wales. Why? Because we do not have... The in, uh, investment in infrastructure, particularly the studio, I've always been a campaigner for the studio. It doesn't have to be a big, shiny pine wood. It doesn't have to be particularly expensive. It, it has to be a shooting space which has certain technical requirements um, in order to, to qualify. With, once you've got that, and as Tommy was saying, one, you've got, we've got very good UK tax reliefs. They're, they're valued highly. We have an incredible skills agenda in this country, UK. Um, and the skills agenda is maintained by a strong link between industry and the training institutions. I also sit on the board of Creative Skillset, specifically because I could see that my job in terms of creating strategy for the industrial um, and economic side of things is directly linked to the degree to which our crews and our facilities are up to speed and up to the state of the art. And I don't think Scotland can do this on its own. Much as I've, I'm all about self-determination for my homeland, I think just as Britain's had to do, you have to surrender a certain amount of sovereignty in order to gain something bigger. Um, and that, I think, is about 
understanding the, the in, industrial environment in which we live, the in, international environment in which we live. You have to understand the paradigm shift that's happening right now. We all know about it. I happen to know a lot about it. And it's amazing. Netflix, <coughs> Netflix is just the beginning. And beyond Netflix are the really big ones, you know, coming in fast. Amazon, obviously. Apple are now coming in. Google, Hulu. And then there's, above and beyond that, you've got Disney. Try to look at what Disney's doing. Disney's just bought 21st Century Fox. What's that all about? Um, you know, Murdoch decided that Fox wasn't big enough. Capitalised at 90 plus billion dollars, it wasn't big enough to, to enter the international battlefield. So he made a smart move, and he went inside Disney, which is much bigger. So just wait, and you'll see what happens with Disney. They're going to start moving in on on the global content. The good news is the demand for entertainment and the demand for content is increasing. What is changing is the means of delivery and the means of production. So if you just take a step back and look at that, that is an incredible opportunity for Scotland. It's an incredible opportunity that has not hitherto existed, which is the demand for content will step outside of the old ways of the, which I was a part of, where the, you were kind of alchemists working in a sort of magic realm for the studio system. Now it's much more business-like. You have to work harder for less, perfect for Scotland. Scotland's got a good cost base, a low cost base, compared to, to the South and certainly compared to America. Um, Scotland used to be a second as a production cluster in the UK after the South East. At the moment, it's now somewhere like fourth, maybe fifth in the UK, after clusters like Wales and uh, uh, Cardiff and Bristol, um, even Leeds, Manchester, that's, that's getting a bit serious, and, of course, Northern Ireland. So we're, we, are, we are failing. Um, we're failing because of uncertainty. We're failing because of good old Scottish caution. Um, and in my dealings, occasional dealings with Scottish enterprise, I've been dismayed, frankly, at the, their apparent inability to understand that this is a real business. This is a real industry. This is much better than shipbuilding. You know, all, all those have gone. This is the future. And not only that, one can get onto the larger thing of the image of Scotland, how Scotland is in the world, is directly linked to your participation or our participation in, in the, the world of the media. That will affect how Scotland performs in all sorts of ways. Can I just come in there? In Scottish Enterprise, under this proposal, Scottish Enterprise is still tasked with supporting the larger companies. Do you think that's a mistake? Just very quickly, um, do you think it's a mistake that they've been given that role? I, I don't think anything's a mistake, frankly, if it's positive and moving forward. But the, the, the trick is the implementation of the new unit is critical. And that means not just keeping it to, forgive me, was like us. This has to be about gaining people who actually really do understand the front line of change. I mean, the success of the BFC is because, well, first of all, I'm, I had personal relationships of trust with key executives in Los Angeles. I brought around the, the BFC, I brought people who had similar knowledge and expertise, that they could phone executives at home at night, and they could find things out that it would be very hard for anyone else to find. And most importantly is the relationship of trust. If I get a call from someone saying, well, could we put this into Scotland, you know? And I say, well, actually, I don't think so. Not this. They trust me because they, they, they know I'm a Scot. They would think, well, I'd say, yes, yeah, Scotland, you know? So they've, they've, you've got to play a very, a very long game. This, nothing's going to happen too fast. Change will happen, but this is a long game. As I said, it took 20 years to get the BFC up and running, creative skill sets sorted out, to get government to understand the importance, not just of the wider creative industries, but of the screen industries, and particularly film and TV. Thank you. David Smith, did you want to come in? There's two, two separate points. One was your point about whether Scottish Enterprise should be involved in that role, and I, I, without being too harsh, no. Um, I, I, think, I think it's... <laughs> if the screen unit exists to do, to do your job, then it should be empowered to do that job. Yeah. Um, that would be my very strong feeling. I think Scottish Enterprise have sat around the table for 10 years and have a lot of time has been sunk into them. 
and it's not really delivered a great deal. Uh, whereas this new unit is a, is a new start, and I think it should be properly empowered to deliver uh, what is there. It's nobody's job. It's got to be somebody's job, or else it's nobody's job. And I think it has to be the screen unit's job. I think, I think there's, there's, a, there's a very basic fact, as, as, people, as, as, as Ken said earlier, was a, you Google film in Wales. It's like, come to Wales, here you are, it's a very easy portal. Here's the person, here's the person at the phone. You know, Northern Ireland's the same. <coughs> it's Scotland is very confusing. There is terrible fragmentation. Do phone Creative Scotland? What minute? You're a, you're a small department of Creative Scotland, and it's really run by folk who like uh, opera and Drapman. It's just it's very unclear. Yeah. Whereas Film Scotland, Screen Scotland, what do you want to call it? The Scottish Screen Unit is not very enticing, to be honest. It, should have, it, it's, it's, it, it smacks, of, it smacks of the incredible lack of ambition which is written through this whole story. It's a very unambitious name for a start, and I don't see where the clarity is of... I, I just, I just, it's a unit within what? Within a what? It's like... It's, if I was coming from somewhere else, I would think that looks a bit unprofessional. Right. Rachel, did you want to come back in with another question? It took a very long uh, time to get some uh, clarity there about Scottish enterprise and the dysfunctional relationship it has with Creative Scotland. But I think we've got there in the end and we've kind of got this message out. Um, I, I, I think that um, the definition and criteria has been criticised and that's what um, has, has just been mentioned. So, yeah, thank you. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Just following up on the, the last couple of points, um, do you think then that uh, there should be uh, this unit should actually be a standalone uh, operation as compared to? Thousand percent. I uh, thought it was a catastrophic decision to merge uh, Scottish Green into uh, Creative Scotland. I thought it lost all its its power, authority, drive, focus. I thought that was a terrible decision. Personally, I thought it always should be every other country in the world I go to. I, I've been in New Zealand this year filming. I've been in uh, filming in Norway. Filmed in Paris this year, or last year, sorry, it's only a few months old, a month old. <coughs> Every other country in the world, you can Google in, film New Zealand, up it pops. It's, uh, it's page one. And the fact that it's so convoluted here is, is embarrassing, frankly. To have that portal. And I think if no. we... If, yeah. it's, That's I, a web designer for two I think days. That having the Scottish screen recommissioned would, would be a nice thing in 10 years time, five years time, but we are where we are today. And I think if you start to, you have to work with the structure that's been put in place today. And that screening is a positive step forward if we can make it work in the way that we, we should. So governance points that were made earlier are, are vital, making sure that that includes industry voices. Also the bandwidth and the expertise of the people that are involved within the unit. Um, they have to have had, I think several speakers have said, recent industry experience. And I actually really like Claire's idea that they should sit there for three years and then move back into industry. And it should be a revolving point, because that you get very comfortable sitting in those roles for a long time. Uh, you don't suffer the slings and arrows that we all do. Um, and it would be quite nice to think that they would face the consequences of their actions. Also because the industry does change so, yep. so much so quickly, you can just get behind if you're... Yeah. An administrator in an yeah. administrative type role, yeah. but not on the floor ever. I yeah. think it's important. I think it's a great idea as well. Yeah. Mm. A question regarding training. Uh, now, it's uh, kind of based upon the past, but certainly looking uh, ahead. Uh, in the past, when uh, someone would have come out of university uh, or come out of, from their particular training program, uh, what would their traditional role have been? Would it have been to maybe go into some, uh, some uh, into the sector within Scotland, or would it just be, can I go straight down to London to get... You got to know somebody, you found a friend, or your uncle, your, whatever it was, whatever your way in was, you found somebody and you became the tea boy and you became the runner, the tea girl, that's how you, and it was that, there wasn't a real structure for training when I started. There is now, thankfully, and it's vital, but it has to be totally linked into the industry. It has to have, and I think, you know, as people have spoken already about it, it, it does exist now and it's great, it has to be, cemented and expanded and it has to be totally tied into productions and productions have to be forced to be part of the part of the process so it's much better now than it used to be i would from my point of view there's a, there's a genuine uh, there, there is a there is a, a a way there is a skills from various uh, agencies there are skills training programs in place now which again need constant improvement and constantly have to be supported and adapted and expanded but it does it, what the, the key thing for me is it has to be tied into production real life it have to be tied into the industry uh, completely for it to be meaningful. I think there's, some, there's, a, there's been a really brilliant uh, scheme over the years called NETS, which I don't think yep. is running this year, which is really, really respected across the UK, and that's because it's kind of on-set work placement. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is, and I, is that quite often people come out of university and actually they've had no experience of the real industry, and they do just go in as a runner anyway. So it's almost 
I mean, it's great to have all the film knowledge, mm. but it, you probably still start at the bottom if that's yeah. your yeah. route anyway. And so I think bringing the National Film Television School up uh, mm. to Glasgow is, is a huge thing, is, is, a, is a massive step forward, yeah. and that should, that should be supported yeah. to the yeah. utmost. It's the Scotland Channel. I mean, for Absolutely. A long, for a long time, we've had a inherently weak domestic market for content. You know, you've had opt outs on BBC One and BBC Two for, for Scotland, you've had an STV, ITV channel that makes very little in comparison to what you might expect a Channel 3 licensee to do. Um, suddenly we had a BBC Alpa, which was a, a, a step forward, a positive step forward. Now we've got this new BBC Scotland channel, which for all the concerns we have about it being underfunded and uh, transmitting an SD, will be generating content. Now you build careers through that structure. You build, you, people will come up with ideas through that structure. Some of those ideas will, will win. Channel is it, should be, it should be done on spend and not hours, because it's very easy to see. We did 112 hours of drama, but it could be the the lowest common denominator drama, you know, if the budgets are looking at. on a separate point, which... <coughs> Yeah. Uh, pick up on the skills, I think the BFI, which is uh, the, the strategic body that leads the industry in all its aspects in the UK, and by, by, mean, by strategic body, I mean it's the body government will talk to. The BFI have just produced last year, at some length, I have to say, um, a, a future film skills strategy, and have just this, the past few months have awarded a £20 million funding to create a skill set to um, open up areas of, of skills that have not yet been properly mined. And one of the, problem for, one of the problems with that is that skill set has tended to be um, government-facing rather than industry-facing. And what we've been trying to do in the last couple of years is to, to change that whole headspace around. Um, and we've succeeded in that. So the creative skill set from now on will be much more informed and much more interlocked with all of the different sectors of industry, including the nations and the English regions. And it's very, very important that Scotland is part of that. I'm not saying it has to be beholden to it. I think if Scotland can be uh, perfectly independent, but it's just stupid, frankly, not to be plugging in to the opportunities that are available in the UK and wider afield. So, so I think we have to, we, there's a big sea change happening, a very positive sea change happening in skills as a matter of survival and as a matter of maintaining productivity and as a matter of continuing foreign earnings, which are critically important for the UK economy. Well, Thank the proposals you. in this screen sector actually assist uh, to ensure that there is a more uh, robust um, kind of set of uh, skills uh, within Scotland so that uh, obviously when, when you go and you talk to others in the future, uh, you could then say, yes, you actually can go and film that in Scotland. You can put that production yeah, in yeah. Scotland. Oh, no, well, I'm, I'm, I emphasise the negative when I made my little anecdote, but I th I th definitely there are positives, for sure. And, and the positives are that the skills base here is rising. Outlander has helped enormously. Every time there's an interface between crew members and facilities with major production, there's learning, there's real learning. It's not an academic thing. There is an academic aspect to it. Um, but it's very much about applied experience and understanding of just how it works. The film business, particularly television, is the same. It's a very human business. It's so human. It's all about who trusts who, who can... I, I ask you to do this job. If I'm a producer, I want to make sure that who, whoever I'm employing is better than me. Because when I'm doing anything less than that, I'm, I'm endangering myself. And if I've had any success, it's because I've done that. I think in terms of the fragmentation, there's also something there about what you're saying is it's a human business and the fragmentation, I think, is about it's all we need to bring the networks together so people know who's who and we can actually start to capitalise on a lot of the really good work that uh, Ian has just described. Because I know when I speak to young people, because they come to us to be supporting artists, they ask us how to get in the business. I've been on set myself on a regular basis and speaking to the runners, often it's because the production team were drinking in that pub that day and they, quite, that young person wanted to get on set and they said, come down and be a runner. Now, we, GBM Casting has worked in a partnership with Edinburgh College and we are trying to have a gateway for young people to find their way into the industry um, because you were saying people in university, they're not getting the real understanding of A, how to get into industry and actually what practical skills you need so hopefully some of this will help. But we need to make sure that information is getting to young people. 
which is the role of Skills Development Scotland, who also have got a part in the collaborative strategy. I'm keen to bring in Ross Greer, because you haven't asked the question yet, Ross. Thanks, convener. Um, <clears throat> keen to come back to issues around governance and accountability. And with governance, obviously, that's something that's inherently internal and structural. I think the direction of travel around governance for the unit seems to be positive, taking on board the concerns, for example, that David's uh, raised around diversity there. But the challenge that you always have with governance is when it boils down to a couple of individuals from industry on the committee, as has been highlighted repeatedly this morning, your industry is an incredibly diverse one. And for a couple of individuals to represent it and all that diversity is a huge challenge, which is where the accountability is critical. But it's considerably more abstract than governance arrangements, which are very direct. Do you think that the direction of travel on accountability around the unit is the right one at the moment? Because it seems considerably less fleshed out than governance is so far. That? Yes. <coughs> uh, this is a very interesting point because uh, personally I think boards are about strategy and policy, not administration. Administration has to be a much more particular, much more specific, much more fleet of foot, to use your phrase. And so with the BFC we have a big national board where everyone sits and Creative Scotland is represented on that, as are, are all the others. But the real work, if I can put it that way, is done by a business subgroup. And that subgroup is appointed people who are brought in because of their particular point of view and their particular skill and knowledge, so that our intelligence is as high as possible. And that is not to gain, say, the main board, not at all. In fact, everything that goes on at the subgroup, which is we, we meet once a month, um, that all gets reported back to the main national board who generally nod it through because they understand that this is good stuff that we're getting, you know. Um, and I think that's probably the way to do this. So you can have two appointees who are the great and the good of the industry and who have the industry's best interests at heart and have knowledge and understanding of the vision thing and all of that. But that, they're not necessarily the ones that we should rely on totally to actually run the front end of the business. I think that the continuation of the Scottish Green Leadership Group alongside the unit, the board, whatever it's called, uh, is, is going to be quite vital. That relations that, that's grown up over the last year or two uh, between those two bodies, combined with the, the oversight of this committee, uh, has been, I think, really useful in moving all of that forward. Um, at, for, in television, there are two real issues, I think, that we face in Scotland. One is the out of London rules, <coughs> which Ofcon are about to consult upon, and the other is licence fee reinvestment. As, as Ian said, the expertise within the unit should be able to address those things. If, if the board has set those as the main strategy points that have to be, to be dealt with. Um, but that interface with the Scottish Green Leadership Group should also run in parallel with it because it has been a really good way of, of ensuring that the industry is listened to. The idea of having uh, actually practitioners is, is part and parcel of, of, the, of the unit. It could be on a rotating basis. It could be a conscription service for a year, whatever it is, because what tends to happen is you know, in that old story, those that don't do teach, you know, the, the ones that actually do the hard end jobs, they, they're very rarely in those positions or are listened to. So I think having people actually at the sharp end seconded to the unit on a rotational basis, whatever you want to do, would be a massively clever idea, in my opinion. Absolutely. There's definitely that practical level missing. There's a strategic overview on how you're going to do governance, but actually in terms of the work that we do with supporting artists and supplying to productions in Scotland, we are absolutely at the coal face because we are chasing that work all the time. We know what's going on and we need to feed that back up. And we need a voice at the table because at no point have we ever been engaged or consulted and we have years of experience, been around for 15 years. So somebody needs to cash in on that experience and that coal face experience as well. And Tommy, you mentioned a number of times now that equivalent structures, equivalent organisations in other countries that you've worked in. Yes. How does that accountability relationship work? Not just the, the government. I mean, we can examine the governance arrangements of equivalent organisations, but the accountability with the industry, <coughs> that cultural accountability. I think you tend to find, I'm not, I don't claim to be an expert on the fact, in most countries I've worked in, you tend to find that the practitioners are much more involved in the governance of those bodies. Mm. It's, they're, they're not at, I just, as a, as a working person, uh, Around the world, our Scottish person working the film business for 29 years, uh, I've never had a known or a real relationship with people in the Quangos. It just have all seemed very removed and not really on the same planet as us. Yeah. They don't come to the set. I don't know them. They've never asked me for me up and say, "What do you think?" Or, 
you know, with this studio space work, or what do you need in a studio? You know, in 28 years, I've been asked once, you know, by a couple of people about, say, uh, what would you look for in a film studio? And I've spent, you know, my whole life in them. I could tell you in 50 minutes what it takes to make a film studio. I've never been asked. So. Can I just come on up and say that we do actually have quite a thriving industry in Scotland, in spite of the fact that Creative Scotland has been around, and in spite of Scottish enterprise, you know, we've done that without their support. So if we can do that, there's a real opportunity now to remodel the governance structures. There's already been talk about we don't, you know, Scottish enterprise hasn't delivered. So. We don't need them. So the, my point is, is that we've done this without them, and that comes back to what you were saying as well, Tommy. Yes. I think the, the, the difficulty that I perceive of Scottish enterprise is that they are old thinking. They're thinking about big companies, thinking about permanent employment, they're thinking about buildings and land and property deals and all of that stuff, which goes against the grain when it comes to the business that we are part of. Yeah, absolutely. We, we are part of a, a virtual business that is globalised, and all these other countries that we're talking about, you know, they understand the need to be part of that, and they understand, that they, they, particularly when they're not <coughs> English-speaking, because we, we win and lose with the fact that we speak the same language as America. But if you go to, I've just spent a big chunk of time in Hungary, where it's immediate. As a producer coming into Hungary, I can get to Viktor Orban, the Prime Minister, within a day, because he understands the significance that lies beyond the obvious. As a, as a uh, film producer, I would sadly say I have made more films in Budapest than I've been in Scotland, not because I've avoided oh, Scotland. Easily, easily. Easily, many yeah, more. 25% tax. Why, why is that? Yeah. And they're so can do, so helpful. They understand that it's not just about the moment, it's about the possibilities that lie beyond that. And as a result, and this is another thing, trust. You say about Netflix and all these guys, they're just people. They're just people, they go home at night, they have their holidays, you know, they turn up for work, they hope they've got their job next week and all of that stuff. They're just people. They're not some sort of fancy um, elite. They're not. And they're generally scared. They're scared because they've got to perform. And they're looking for solutions and they're looking for them more around the world than they ever did before. And so Scotland should be part of what, that. What are the key things that we need to do to, to be like Hungary and is this unit going to deliver them? I don't think you can be like Hungary, if you don't make a mistake. But I think you learn from Hungary, you learn from Czech Republic, you learn from Romania, you learn from South Africa. These are, these are nations competing now actively to get a lion's share of the international film production business. I think we learn from London as well. I mean, the primacy of IP is, is a lesson well learned. The whole of the TV and the international television industry is based upon the value of IP. Um, and it's still, it, it, to this day, it, it's commissioned in London from London-based producers because they come up with the best ideas. So if we want to move that debate forward, you have to invest in the skill of developing ideas. Mm -hmm. so, again, well, whilst I totally understand the idea of keep it, keep it here, you know, grow local talent and so on, I personally, because of my own experience, and Tommy's the same, um, we learn so much by going away and by putting ourselves at risk, if you like, in the bigger clusters. It's a business of clusters. And you learn, you, you learn experience and you come home, hopefully. And, and certainly, I, I know Tom is the same, we've never lost sight of where we come from. But it, unfortunately, we have to spend a great deal of our time elsewhere. But the knowledge that people like us have is available to Scotland. And so if you come back to that subgroup idea, you have a small group, it's not a big meeting like this, you're talking about six people, maybe. But those people are all handpicked to do particular, to cover particular aspects of futurology in the film and TV business. It's simple common sense. Are you talking about? Are you talking about a subgroup of the board, or are you talking about the, Some, the executive level? Subgroup of the board, the, yeah, right. which informs the board. One, one massive thing that would make a, a massive difference to Scotland is starting to look at community benefit clauses, how that public funding is attached to a target of, you, if you come in and you're given public sector money, that you must use, I don't know, 25%, 50% of local companies. Outlaw King, which was Netflix, which was done by Cigna Films, came up. That was £100 million worth of investment in Scotland. 
The three casting agencies which are represented here today went to see the second AD and he said, I'll decide who I use, I'll be using somebody from London. And we worked out that that was a loss for Scotland's casting agencies as £100,000 worth of investment into us. And there was nothing we could do, there was nobody we could go to, there was nobody we could see, there was no legislation to back that up. And as a result, we lost a massive opportunity to supply extras and all of that that goes into that as well. And that would make a massive difference, not only to the casting agents in Scotland, but to crew, to facilities, if there was some sort of tie up to public money with community benefit clauses. Which is around the kind of three uh, tick boxes they're looking for, which are cultural, economic, and social impact. And, that um, be... and that's a, that I think is a really useful lever we should be uh, concentrating on. They Especially when you come to Ireland. national broadcasters like the BBC, um, you know that would help address issues we have, concerns we have around lift and shift, for example. When I phone Northern Ireland Productions to say, "Won't use it, you because we've got to use NI." We know the London creep is in Scotland. We know the London creep is in Northern Ireland. I phoned somebody in Southern Ireland the other day. Nope, we have to use locally based companies. Phil and Wales are exactly the same about that. And actually their application form before they can get public money has to demonstrate who they're going to talk to and who they're going to use for. And that in itself would make a massive difference. Ian? Bearing in mind the, the benefit that comes from what we would call sweeteners, which are local incentives. They don't have to be big, massive, but they're almost token to film production. You think of Netflix and huge money and all of that stuff, but £100,000 placed to incentivise them for to come to a particular place will make all the difference. Not so much because of the money, but because of the goodwill it demonstrates. It makes a huge difference. I mean, it's huge, you know, for Disney, Paramount, Universal, when someone says, oh, they've offered us free flights to go and scout South Africa. Uh oh, suddenly you're in South Africa because somebody managed to get, you know, and for his, it, it's, it, can be as, it can be as pedantic and, and mundane as that. Mm -hmm. Those little things really matter. You'd be amazed how much they matter. So, so the, the budget of 20 million is not enough, given yeah. the 170 million I mentioned earlier. OK, Ofcom is, is going to be looking at this in relation to the TV, uh, and this committee is going to be having another session on that. But in terms of this new unit within Creative Scotland, are, are we tough enough in terms of incentivising the film companies um, uh, to use local crews, or do you think we could be tougher? When we're working on the sort of projects you were talking about before, so you were talking about the local, the you know, the major local projects, so Grandchester. I was just doing Shetland, for example, which is a big chunker for Scotland in the summer, um, and it kind of you have to hope you're making Shetland when Outlander are on a holiday, because otherwise you're you're toiling to get the, 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 the people you need. But the but BB, that the ITV make that. They're not a Scottish company. They have to show a certain spend in Scotland. They have to put a certain spend into Scotland um, to, 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 to work within Ofcom's rules. And uh, I've worked with other, other um, production companies who've come, same thing when we're making the replacement, Left Bank were making that. They had to show their spend in Scotland. Those, that spend is always, it's always a negotiation because as soon as the production company isn't from Scotland, um, their, their production fee, which is part of the qualifying spend, isn't part of, isn't part of the equation. And my job as a line producer gets slightly harder because then I'm trying to f make up the difference of their production fee in what I spend in Scotland on facilities and crew. Um, we don't get any points for having booked Scottish actors. Um, you do get some... I, I always include the um, talent from the supporting artists as part of the, the points scheme, but that has been argued. I've been argued against that by people in BBC Scotland when we're reporting. It's, it's, a, strange, an, it's a strange anomaly that nobody really seems to understand very well. And the, but the biggest thing that makes a difference to that spend, if you want to keep that spend on the right side of of the percentage you're supposed to spend is if we can do post-production, because if you can't have the, the fee from the production company be Scottish, if you're doing your post-production in Scotland, then that's a huge chunk of your, your budget. And that, that, along with things like background artists and crew and facilities and all these things, makes a difference. But all, all too often we see that heading south as well, because the production companies come from the south, so they want to go home, 
to do their post, and it's totally understandable. They want to be able to do that. Shetland did its post production in Scotland this year at Blazing Griffin. Um, I worked in another production called Murder, which did its post production at what was 422. Um, partly because we pushed really hard to make those things happen with the with the commissioners and with the production companies that were making them. And it often falls to the line producers to, to try and sell what we've got here. Um, and I think you do need to incentivise it, but I don't know who polices that at Ofcom because I'm, it's, it is all, it's often a fudge. And when the decision is made that we're not going to do our post in Scotland or we really don't want to, to do other things, then there's very little I can do about it. But yet, it will be it will often be my job to explain why it didn't happen. But I don't I can't I don't have the answers. We it's about the IP. If we had if the if the if the stuff was being commissioned directly out of Scotland, we could we could satisfy Ofcom's requirements very easily. But until that starts to happen, it it's, it is a bit of a it feels like total. But also yeah, the other, the other, I know that David Smith wants to come in. Sorry. On out of London it is by far, I think, the most important fight we have to get right over the next year or two, which is why having expertise within the new unit that understands the nuances of out of London rules and how it works is going to be very important. Um, substantive base, which is the, kind of the first tick box, is often the one that's missed on drama and comedy projects because they are commissioned and made down south and outsourced to, to Scotland for produ production. Um, we have to get the substantive base element of it right. At the moment, out of London is about production and where production takes place around the UK. And I'd like to see a shift to economic impact and value. You know, that's partly to do with IP, it's partly to do with the retention of profits. And it's, that's what makes companies sustainable. You know, I, I go back to where I used to work at IWC Media again. It was sustainable because it owned the IP, it owned the profits, it could generate new ideas, it could generate new opportunities. <laughs> Uh, as things currently stand, your substantive base is, a, is not an essential tick. It's a one of three options. Um, if you get it, it unlocks lots of spend variables, which, as we've discussed in front of this committee before, do not necessarily mean that even though 100% of a value for a project is set against the Scottish quota, as little as 10% can actually be, take place in Scotland. Okay. Ian value. Smith. Um, thank you. I th <coughs> the, just picking up on that, I've tended to concentrate on the inward investment side of things and the economic underpinning of the, of, uh, the industry. Apart from the economic benefits of that, the obvious ones, the considerable ones, it, there's no point in having that if it doesn't in some way sustain and support and grow the indigenous IP. We have to, that has to be part of the programme. So it's a kind of double whammy. You're bringing it in, you're bringing the stuff in, and you're kind of suffering a bit because prices will go up, there'll be, there'll be your crew having to work in lesser positions and so on, but the learning processes that will be going on will also be sustaining the Indigenous industry. It is crucial because the inward investment business is very hard fought and won, very hard fought and won. Um, and we need a more sustainable business where we hear our own voices and we understand our own mentality and we <coughs> define ourselves by, by the, the cultures that we, that we can express. That's very important. Feed each other. That's interesting. But, you know, I think uh, inward investment of the bigger shows, actually, it trains people, it feeds them, they learn, they have their own ideas, they go off. It's actually can be very symbiotic. Absolutely. So they're, not, they're not in opposition at all. And the IP thing is vitally important, and our, our maintaining our cultural input into the films we make is vitally important, but they're not, you can have both things not only can live together, they must live together. You can play the, the, the two side by side. Yeah. And the industry is used to that. It's used to these incentives and regulations. Completely, yes. Yeah. Yeah. You tend it, to get a two-tier two, sorry, a two -tier system starting to work. When people are making good money out of the big American productions coming in and are then taking less to, to enable smaller projects or more local projects to happen. Yeah, but one begets the other quite often. It really yeah. does, yeah. Richard, did you have a very quick supplementary? Well, it's just a general question. Right. Um, well, we're actually over time already. Oh, right. Um, the Natalie Usher, um, obviously, uh, she's going to be replaced. Um, what sort of uh, talent and skill would you like to see replacing? That's Natalie not really Usher? a supplementary, Rachel. I would like her just to come and talk to me and ask me what I need. That's all I want. I'm not asking for money. I'm not asking for anything else. Just come and find out what those of us grafting at the front end of the business need and the casting agents are open for business and we want a place at the table and we want whoever goes in, whatever the screen unit looks like, we want to talk to, uh, them to talk to us. 
going uh, is the f one I think thing Natalie to say. Natalie had quite a lot of the skills we would like to see the yeah. next person have, and I think if someone like Natalie's given their head to do what they know is right, then they'll be able to do it. I think it depends who's who is. Yeah, I think that, that they need to be given given the room yeah. to do what they know is right. I think Good. that Natalie had a very particular set of skills and experience, which was has has been brilliant actually for for Scotland and. Um, it would be amazing to find someone similar, but uh, I think just because she really understood the business of film, which um, is, is important, so, yeah. And, the, and she understood IP, where yeah. she came from. It's yeah. part of what we're all... We're all hoping for, as we say, running two things alongside each other. Yeah. OK. Richard? Well, thank you. Uh, it was just in light of everything that um, both panels have said, um, it strikes me that for some reason in recent years, the industry or government or whoever has failed to articulate uh, and encapsulate the massive potential of this industry to Scotland. And I just wondered if you agree with that and what we could do to address that. Um, I think for Scotland, almost more than any other country I can think of, it needs a strong creative industries sector. And uh, that's, that's because the, way, the world I see is very much about are you part of the, the networking of, of information flow, uh, entertainment, everything? And if you're not part of that, then you're not in the, in the ballgame at all. So Scotland, I think, just on that broad macro level, is, is very, very important for Scotland to have a voice, particularly as we move steadily towards self-determination. There, to there has to be a sense of the, the, the culture and the creativity of the Scottish people. I think while it remains a devolved, a, a retained matter to Westminster, it, there are limits to what the Scottish Government can do. I think that they have put a lot of effort into the sector over the last few years. Clearly there were deep systemic issues to do with the fracturing between Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise. And there was actually, I remember five, six, seven years ago, a real conversation around just an education process as to what's the difference between film and television? What's the difference between in-house production and indie production? Um, we went on quite a long education process as a, as a wider group. There's a real understanding now within the Scottish Government as to how this works. Um, it takes time to kind of change things, but I think I'm, I'm optimistic. I think there's lots of reasons to be optimistic over the next few years. I, I agree with uh, my colleagues who work in the wider international world of film, which you know is a, a mystery to me. But in terms of British domestic TV production, um, we have a new channel, we've got the new screen unit, we've got money coming from the Scottish Government. These are all things we didn't have a few years ago, so there's, it's a start. And I think also to add to that, the, 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 the freelance workers have organised themselves into an organisation which has you know, given a paper to this committee. The things that the recommendations within that paper you know, are backed up by 750 people that work in the industry, and I think they're worth taking on board. A lot of, a lot of what we would like... I read it again, it's very, it's very clear, it's very well written, it's recommendations. I, I would back up 100% in terms of what needs to happen next with that screen unit and what needs to happen. And I think one of the great things about the, the kind of stushy around the Pentland film studio was that the, the freelancers got organised. There was something to fight for. There was something they could see, something that they, they had their eye on a prize and they wanted it. And all of that's kind of come, it's been a bit of a perfect storm. You know, that hopefully that studio's going to be up and running sooner rather than later. We'll see the work start to come, um, more work, more, more of that work. Um, for a while, there will be much more experienced people arriving to teach us something, but that's, that's fine. You know, we've got something to learn. And, I, and, you know, I do think it is an optimistic time, and I think that people are beginning to understand the value of our business much more, partly because of those arguments. I think, I think there's massive opportunities ahead. As everyone said here, there's the, 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 the whole paradigm shifted, the business is exploding, as the desire for content is increasing, not decreasing, and we should get our share of it. You need a film studio. I think it's a basic building block of filmmaking, and the lack of it is, uh, is, uh, uh, is a disaster. And that should be a priority one from my point of view. Wendy? Yeah, I mean, I think as um, Claire and other people are saying is that it is optimistic, but I think it's about that screen unit proposal being delivered properly and with the right input and with the right people running it really isn't it that's what, so that and taking on everybody's input if you want to. i want the committee to have the courage to actually make real change here this is a real opportunity if we're telling you it's not working 
then, you know, for too long, public sector has just maintained status quo and people have been recycled into different jobs. This is a brilliant opportunity to do a different, something different and a different model which we can pick from any part of the world and really implement in Scotland so that these kind of exceptional people can, you know, we can make it work and tell the world Scotland's open for business. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank all our panellists and panel two for coming and giving us our time today. It's very much appreciated. Thank you very much. And I shall now suspend and go into private session. <laughs>